Give us a level stay. Check one, two. Perfect. Check, check, check one, two, three, four. Ready? All right. And we are back between two Yetis with one of my favorite people in the world, Stu Jones. How are you, sir? Good to see you again, Zach. And you as well. Day five, Miami International. Well, Miami Boat Show. Yes. Uh, it is international, though. It is Miami International. I saw some people from another country here, so that I makes it international. Well, we are. Well, well you are, of course, yes. Absolutely. Day so am I. I'm from Canada. Oh, you are? I'm from Canada. I never told you that? No. This no, guy's going to walk on our set. That's fine. It, it makes it's it more right. interesting. Part of the boat uh, show thing, right? How's show been for you, actually? It's been great. This is our fifth day. We've had uh, a lot of traffic here, uh, much more than we've had today. In fact, yesterday we could not have done this little thing because there were so many people here at the booth, probably because I had some of the girls of FPC at the booth. And that would help. Therefore, there was an attention grabber. Therefore, I had a lot of traffic at the booth for four days. Today, it's family day. Right. And, uh, of course, being Monday, it's always a little quieter on Monday anyway. It's always a little odd day, like at the Fort Lauderdale show now, they've moved it Wednesday to Sunday. You yes. were there, right? I mean, I, yes, I was. Did you yes. find that a better setup, or do you like having the extra Monday? I like the Monday. Yeah? Yeah, I like the Monday. But, okay, just you know, either way. a little time just to, yeah. to calm down a little bit. And, uh, so yeah. tell us a little bit about it, because you're, you're the Florida Powerboat Club, right? 25 years in business. Obviously, we know what you do, but tell us a little bit about yeah, what you got. Uh, I started the Florida Powerboat Club in 1992. Right. It was called the Sunny Isles Powerboat Club for a year uh, because I started at Sunny Isles Marina. Then a lot of the other marinas wanted to get on board. They liked the fact that we could operate boating events from their marina yep. and attract their customers to go boating more. When you go boating more, you have more fun, you stay in the lifestyle, and you buy another boat. So yep. obviously there was a marine trade side to it. For me, it was more just uh, of, of a way to approach the Florida lifestyle. I moved from Canada, I moved from the cold. Uh, I moved in uh, 91 and I wanted to do something that involved boating and so it was a career choice for me. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted it to be a lifestyle career so I wanted to be able to go boating and learn boating and even educate people on boating yeah. uh, and, and somehow derive a livelihood from that. So it was, a you know, there were baby steps at the beginning but the club grew. In 1993 we incorporated as a Florida Powerboat Club and uh, then we started doing a, a lot of events, poker run events primarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, we catered to a cruising audience and we catered to a performance boating audience. Over the course of a few years, it became more of a performance boating thing. Power boaters like to be in the company of other power boaters. And uh, uh, so we, um, we started doing poker runs, but in a different way. You know, poker runs, I didn't invent them. Uh, poker runs existed in airplanes, uh, snowmobile events, car events. There was some boating events that were poker runs. My experience was that people that came to Florida wanted to have everything packaged because yeah. a lot of the people that came down were from out of state they wanted the hotel rooms they wanted the dockage they wanted to go and adventure and explore but they didn't know how to get there yeah uh, so they kind of wanted it all packaged into one weekend so we started doing these three and four day event formats uh, and they grew to big events we started doing Key West uh, and we got to well over a hundred boats participating we knew that we had something there and then we started other venues we started yeah. going to other parts of Florida the Florida Panhandle, Jacksonville, Florida, the west coast of Florida, Fort Myers, St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay. Uh, and then so we essentially created an event platform that gave people choices and a lot of options as far as things to do and places um, to go. Absolutely. I mean, I've been to your Key West poker run before uh, down in Key West. And I was just amazed about how many people from far away came. You had a guys from Texas drag their boat down to do the run, people from uh, Norway. I mean, it was just a great event. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that Florida is a great place to go boating year round. And everybody from around the world wants to come here. It's kind of on their bucket list to go boating in Florida. So yeah. we've provided them with a, you know, a platform to do that. Yeah. And uh, so that seems to have grown. And uh, so yes, indeed, our membership is from a lot of different states. I mean, we really have probably less than 20% of our membership are actually from Florida. They're from, they're from all over the states. They're from Canada, they're from Europe, uh, they're from South America. and. People will actually transport their boats several thousands of miles to bring them to Florida, to use them with us, and uh, and then take them back home again. Correct me if I'm wrong. You specialize in preliminary power boats and yes. essentially boating, which is fairly dangerous. So you want to do it in a more of a controlled setting. That's correct. Kind of what yeah, that's about, right? safety management is a top priority with our organization. Um, we can't just talk about safety, we have to enforce safety. So we have mandatory safety meetings, yeah. captain's meetings before events. 
We have mand mandatory PFD, so you have to wear life jackets when you run in our events. We have speed control, so if you have a, depending on the speed or the class of your event, we have a sport boat class, we have a performance class, and we have a high performance class. So we could basically give somebody a 50 mile an hour class and say, okay, you can't go any faster than 50. You've got to stay in that group. And you can go up to 125 or 150. So the fastest boats are running upwards of 150 miles per hour. That's very, very, I mean, some of the boats that you guys are on are unbelievable. Turbines, it sounds like a jet starting up. Yeah, it's such a fun thing to be involved in. Yeah, they, they don't really have any other function than going fast and having fun, right? And, that's, and, boating, right? and that's true, but that's also evolved. Now, uh, you know, when I met your family back, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, we were involved in, uh, you got involved in a few poker runs with us and you, you saw a lot of those boats. But since that time, We've created a more of a center console sport boat platform is very popular. Yeah. So now all of a sudden it's not necessarily just about going fast. Now we've got a boat with a little more beam, a little more space, a cabin down below, yeah. outboard motors which are very reliable, and maybe the opportunity to even sleep on the boat. Yeah. Uh, the boats have more creature comforts, more seating, better, bigger and better stereos, uh, you know, air conditioned cabins, and so you're starting to see. What I think, anyway, is more utility yeah. and more of a, a different approach now. Rather than it's not all about going fast anymore. Now it's more about enjoying the experience. How's the market grown? I mean, obviously before the 2008 turn, everyone wanted faster boats, you know, everything like that. Was there a downturn, or has it come back, or are people looking for a little bit more? Like you were so, saying, pretty saying? much all of the above. Yes, of course, we had a downturn. A lot of companies went away. Uh, a lot of the big uh, exotic power went away. Uh, a lot of the people that um, couldn't really afford the lifestyle anymore, they went away for a little while. They simply, they've, they've come back. So yes, it's come back. Yes, uh, we've seen, you know, really a big, a big surge back towards high performance. But like I said earlier, not always about being the fastest boat out there anymore. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, there's still those guys out there. You know, a lot to do with Mercury Racing, who have built a very reliable stern drive product, high performance, twin turbocharged platforms that can take boats to 150 miles per hour. So you're still gonna see that. You still have a lot of that going on. And you have, um, you know, you just have the outboards too. So, excuse me, there's a camera right there. Just to, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's all, but um, so we have, um, we've seen a, a, a big surge back this way. We're looking good. Uh, we're, our membership numbers are about, you know, we're strong again. Yeah. Where we could have about 500 members on average uh, per any given year. We have uh, events that are having attendance of 150 to 200 boats yep. at one time. That's a lot of boats to manage and a lot of people as well. Key West Poker Run is the biggest one. We have another one uh, in, uh, in August that has about uh, 180, 160 to 180 boats. It's called Emerald Coast. Uh, and then we have a lot of other events that average between 40 and 50 boats uh, at a time. So you're talking now boats, but also number of people. So. Back in the day, maybe there were four people on the boat because it had a very small cockpit, probably yeah. a sit-down boat. Now you've got a big center console boat that has seating for 15 or more. Yeah. So you'll have boats that have 12 to 13 to 14 people on board. So you might have 50 boats, but now you've got 400 people wow. on those 50 boats. It used to be 200 people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for us, our business model has a lot to do with the number of people that are attending. So our functions are bigger. Our hotel, our accommodations are, are more involved. Your footprint's just much, much bigger. Footprint's right? much bigger. You know, we're, we're lodging based, so we're booking a lot of hotel rooms for a lot of people and the functions are bigger. So it's really helped our business model in that respect. We're getting, you know, far more participants on these events because of that trend. That's fantastic. Do you also help people who want to buy boats like this? Do you actually go down and say, just do people come to you and say, still, I want to buy a boat, what do I need? Because if I was going to buy one of these boats, you're the first person I would call. We we do have we do have that happen uh, from time to time. Uh, we have uh, we have people that will call me up and ask me to help them make their purchase. Yeah. I, I try to be careful with that because I have a lot of different manufacturers that I'm involved with yeah. with the club, and uh, you know sometimes people aren't even really sure what they want to buy. But so I try to guide them in, in terms of uh, the style and the direction of what kind of boat they want to buy. Yeah. But I might point them at three or four different manufacturers so and let them make their decision. Your history in boating started when you were in Canada, right? It did. I mean, you've always been involved with this kind of. I start. There, I right? started in Canada, and I, um, uh, you know, family boating on a, on a small lake. Yeah. Uh, with a ski boat, you know, a 15-foot ski boat with a 50-horsepower Mercury, uh, and then I 
started to meet a lot more boating friends as I grew up. Family got a bigger boat. I started. I, spart, I actually began spending weekends on the boat. Right. We had a little 23 foot with a cutty cabin, and on the weekends I used to go and dock it at the city dock up in Aurelia, Ontario, and hang out down there. And I got a lot of boating friends, and some of them had bigger boats. And then I sort of started to see this high performance side of the equation. Yeah. Now you didn't see a lot of those boats in Ontario, but you did see a few from time to time. And I went on my first poker run event in 1989. Wow. Okay. And when I did that, uh, I was in the media business then, and I produced uh, a calendar, a powerboating calendar, uh, with all these speed boats, these big high performance boats, and I saw my first ever cigarette boat. Thought that was really cool. Of course, Fountain was uh, popular at the time. Uh, Scarab was popular at the time. Baja was building boats. Formula was building boats. So I started to sort of move around in these performance boating circles and soon realized that really they were all from Florida. Yeah, yeah. All these boats came from Florida. Yeah. And all of the activity, so obviously the, the heartbeat of the performance industry was Florida. So I gravitated to Florida, wanting to be around that more and wanting to pursue a marine career. So I, I took that interest uh, with, with me to Florida. Yeah. I immigrated in 1991 and started in the marine trade immediately. Correct me if I'm wrong though, is this a misconception that power boats like this evolved around the drug races in the 80s and 90s. In that's that's not a misconception. If you watch the old episodes of Miami Vice, that was kind of a Hollywood version of what was going on here. Right. But clearly that was what was going on. Because the stories I heard is that the drug lords went to these boats and said, make me faster. The police then went and said to the same company, make it faster. Well, the, the federal government, uh, you know, um, George, George W. George Bush, senior, uh, basically employed Don Arano, who was one of these guys that built these offshore power boats, to, to build a, a boat called USA Racing, right. which was essentially a high-performance chase boat that the feds could use, the DEA could use, to chase the drug runners. Right. So Don Arano actually built the boats that the drug runners were using, and then he was building the boats for the U.S. government that they were using to chase the other boats. So that was kind of a well, but that, this is a dangerous uh, game to play. All of these stories are true, but is it, it isn't true that it isn't indeed true that you know most of the shipments of contraband came in through um, came in through uh, the Bahamas. So they needed a boat to be able to get to the Bahamas safely. They needed to be able to pick up the the shipment, turn around, and drive back to Florida. So clearly, in the 80s and the 90s, the drug trade was primarily supported by offshore power boats, wow. uh, which were doing the transportation. So. Uh, yes, indeed, that's how it happened. I don't know that it's happening like that anymore. I don't know if it continues to happen that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's because I heard a story, one of my friends has a performance, I think you told me this story, and in Fort Lauderdale, if a boat's going fast, they want to know what it is, and yeah. they'll intercept it, which is yeah. really yeah. interesting. I think back in the day, though, they used to trick them, and they, they'd have about six or seven of those boats going fast, and the DEA or, you know, or Homeland Security, which is Homeland Security now, could maybe only catch two of those boats, yeah. and the other five would get away. So it's a game of numbers. Then, it's a right? game of numbers, clearly. So when we talk about performance boats, so they obviously there is a class of wealthier people that own these boats. Like one of the poker runs I came on, this guy had a beautiful paint job that took eighty thousand hours or something. Yeah, really sure. over the top. Yeah. What's the craziest thing you've heard that someone's asked for in a boat like this, or a crazy story from? these being used, I mean, well, I'm, I'm sure you got some you can't talk about, but I'm sure there's a couple. No, I, I think I think that they it's a one-up in sport, you know, somebody builds something and then this guy wants to one-up him. But it's, so, it's, like you said, it's not all about speed anymore, I mean, I'm sure it No, no, speed, it's a, the showmanship is a big thing. Uh, I think that um, probably the most outrageous thing that I've seen was done by one of our club members who's still in the club now. And when he went to the dock, he wanted to have the loudest stereo. Right. So. You know, all of the speakers are in the cockpit of the boat. So they're designed so the people can hear them while you're running. So the speakers are all pointed into the cockpit. So what he found was that when everyone was at the dock, they turned their stereos really loud, but it was only really loud inside the cockpit of the boat. He wanted his music to go to the dock. Right. So he built a hydraulic platform down into the deck of the boat that was concealed. And he pushed the button, and up from the hull came a giant platform and it had like four giant speakers, giant, you know, uh, I think they were JL audio speakers. Yeah. And it had its four different amplifiers to support that system. And he could rotate it and point it at the dock so that this <laughs> music was going right where he wanted it to go. 
So that was kind of a cool thing. Was that the, the Corvette boat that we saw? That was the Corvette boat. That was the, yeah. It looked like a Corvette from the back. And the, the other thing that I think that we see in the bling arena, the, I think that bling is really the key word. I can't think of a better word because that's it's really boating bling. But you, as you well know, you and your brother and your family, that your involvement in a, your previous uh, enterprise was selling underwater lights. Well, you know, ocean. And current. Still do that. Current, yes. <laughs> And the, the, um, the underwater lights then became cockpit lights, and then they became, you know, uh, tower lights and uh, T-top lights, and now, then they became different colors. Yeah, yeah. And then they became flashing to the music, and then they became, so basically, uh, you know, that whole uh, dockside show yeah. is now the big thing. While your boat is running, you know, I'm sure if it runs great and everything, you go fast, you get there, but the real show now is the dockside show when you get there. Yeah. You're gonna have a loud stereo, you wanna have really cool lighting, and what one of the guys put on his boat in his T-top was, he could push a button and a shower would activate on the T-top. And when nobody knew it was there, there was a shower head there that was built into the T-top. And when the girls were out there dancing on the back of the thing, he'd hit a button and they would shower all the girls. And that was like a new thing, that was pretty cool. So they were doing that in Key West Poker Run last year. That's very cool. Yeah. So your people who buy these boats, are they in, an aging crowd. I mean, your function I see as getting new people into boating this way and buying boats. Yeah. I mean, is that what the uh, manufacturers rely on you for we, as well? Um, as far as the demographics and the ages and the and the people, it seems to be across the board. Okay. I think that there's a negative relationship between a middle-aged male who's getting older. He actually decreases in his mentality, like he becomes more of a kid. Right. Like as he becomes closer to that 60, he wants to be 35 again. Yeah. So you're going to see a lot of guys my age, in my late 50s, trying to do things that they should have been done in 25 years ago, doing 25 <laughs> years ago. So that's called a midlife crisis. Right, okay. And this sport thrives on those guys, <laughs> right? This is and then there's also the type A personality. This sport also thrives on those guys. We want to live large, be large, be seen, and be heard. We tend to be Many of us tend to be sort of like, you know, there's a little bit of this going on. And, you know, purely for the love of the sport. Yeah. It's just, a, it's a sport of showmanship. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And I think that that, uh, that tends to be a common theme, a theme throughout. Uh, so as far as the age of the people, it's all over the map. But clearly, you know, there's not a lot of millennials in our sport. No. You know, these are expensive toys to own. Most people, when they have the financial wherewithal to buy a million dollar powerboat, they're probably in their 50s already. Yeah. Or they're probably in their late 40s or 50s or 60s. And they've probably made a decision that owning a boat like that was on their bucket list. And, it's, and they've had several, several boats in the middle. And now they finally decided, now it's time for me to buy that million dollar big go fast machine. So you're gonna see a lot of that. I've got a guy in my club who's 76 years old. 76. Yeah, Don Lightfoot from Texas. He has a 52-foot Nortec Cat uh, with Mercury Racing 1350s, and the boat runs about 145 miles an hour. And he's 76. I mean, I've been and 90 with you in a boat, and that was plenty fast. Plenty yes. fast enough. So, uh, so clearly, there's, um, you, you know, I think that the passion is ageless. I think that you're always going to have the passion. Some guys might go really, really fast for several years, and then say, you know what? I got that out of my system, yeah. but I still love the sport. Yeah. I still love the people. I just don't want to go 150 anymore. So he's going to go buy a center console with outboards, and he's going to go 85. Yeah. But he's okay with that. Yeah, yeah. Been there, done that sort of thing. Because and how is like with the fuel price that went up a few years ago and now come down? I remember when you had King of Clubs, you had reconfigured it to run on 87. 89. 89. Yes. 89. I mean, are all boats now that want to go really fast and high octane, and some had special racing fuel, didn't they? The, the octane requirements for a lot of these high performance machines have been a major focus of all the big engine builders because the inability for many people to buy higher octane fuel uh, anywhere on the water. You know, yeah. you can buy 93 octane at your gas pump anywhere, you know, at any gas station on the street, street gas. You can't get it on the water. It's a, it's a product that, um, that only the high performance boats require. So therefore, all of the big performance builders engine builders like Mercury Racing are focusing on more pump gas, pump fuel configurations. You still Rec 90 or do you go through it so fast? You know, rec, rec 90 is very popular, but 
um, you know, ethanol is not as big of an issue for the newer engines because they're built to withstand ethanol. Right, okay. But it's a good point that you brought up because as an organizer, in my case, if I have 30 boats that require absolutely must have 93 octane, that means I've got to go get a tanker truck and bring it to the marina and pump from a tanker truck to fill those boats up. So what Mercury Racing has done and what a lot of custom engine builders are doing is building engines, they're detuning them, they still have a lot of high performance, but they're detuning them, they're changing the fuel mapping system like I did on the Nortec 10 years ago so that they can drive, they can operate perfectly on 89 octane. So what that's doing is giving them way more range in terms of the applications. In other words, they can even change the mapping by putting a, a simple flash drive into the dash. So they have a Jeez. dual, okay. they're called dual cal motors. And if you go over to the Mercury Racing Boots, you'll see them. You change that, that little fob goes in there, changes the calibration, changes the mapping of the fuel. Now your engine's running on a different computer. It's gonna lower the RPM. It's gonna, oh. change the, the, it's gonna change the timing just a little bit. And it's gonna operate in a different way. So now it knows it's got 89 octane. It's gonna, it's gonna run a little differently. And then now when you get the better fuel, you can turn it back over to the other calibration and you can run the engine higher and harder and not have any problem knowing that the engine's gonna fail. Is there no problem with mixing the fuels together? Because obviously you're not gonna fill it up when it's empty. I mean, or, you know. Um, there's, there's, there's not a problem as long as you know what you're doing with mixing fuel. You do have to mix fuel sometimes. So you, you're just gonna have to make the right calibrations. If you know your, your, your boat holds 200 gallons and you have 200 gallons of 93 and you burned off 110, you know you've got 90 left of 93. Well, if you're gonna go put a bunch of 87 or 89 octane in, You've got to average the fuel calculation out in your mind. Yeah. So you got to do a bit of thinking. You can't. You got to do a little bit of thinking. <laughs> this is, this is. Uh, but you know, obviously, there's another thing though. One other thing that Mercury Racing does with their engines is they're, they actually have sensors that detect the octane grade of the fuel, and they'll actually yeah. respond accordingly to the octane that you're putting in the fuel, or to the fuel that you're putting in the it's boat. Amazing. Yeah. Just so like the technology is just getting so good. I mean, that's what, can just we, it. what can we expect in like? Is it, is it, again, is it going to be about speed now, or is it going to be about fuel, or, or well, both? It's, I mean, it's, always it's still about speed. Speed is never going to go away. How fast can you really go before it's stupidly dangerous? Though? Well, it depends on a lot of things, you know. Um, the speed of the boat, you know, it, it goes back to, there's a Coast Guard doctrine, uh, rules of the road doctrine, it's rule six in the U.S. Coast Guard rules of the road. And rule six, you know, the simple version of what rule six is, is that you can go as fast as the conditions allow you to go. It's based on the conditions that you're in, the boating conditions, how windy is it, how wavy is it, is there any current that's present? What kind of boat do you have? What kind of hull bottom do you have? What kind of propulsion do you have? The how many people How many people do you have on board? What's your experience? So um, it really relates back to common sense. Yeah. It relates back to just your you know common sense in terms of and that's a simple I mean that's really the answer to how fast you can go. Yes, everyone still wants to go fast, and technically, there are no speed limits on the open ocean. Yeah. There are speed limits on the intracoastal waterways, yep. uh, clearly, and, and on a, in a, anywhere where there's congested boating, anywhere where the John Q. public and commercial traffic and recreational traffic are sharing the waterways, you need to be on top of your game. Um, but uh, it really comes down to, if you like to go fast, and the, the conditions are right to go fast, and you're an experienced driver, and you're ready to wear your safety gear, your safety, your PFDs, and have your kill, swift, uh, kill lanyard in place. In other words, if you come away from the helm and your engines are still running and that boat is running wildly by itself, that's a problem, right? Serious so that's problem. why you have your lanyards to release the power of the motor, kill the power of the motor. If, if you get upset in the boat, you hit a wave funny and the operator gets thrown from the helm, it's gonna kill the engines immediately. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that we mandate uh, that are compulsory with our, with our events. But uh, other than that, you know, um, I think that there's just, uh, it's all about education. Yeah. It's all about- uh, And that's what you provide then, right? We provide that. And so, you know, people need to know that where they fit best, yeah. you know, and sometimes they don't know. Sometimes they think it's all about going fast. And somebody says, well, I don't want to be at the back of the pack all the time. Well, what's wrong with being at the back of the pack? Actually, it's less, there's less pressure back there. Absolutely. You can yeah. enjoy the ride, take pictures, enjoy the scenery. and. You know, uh, there's no pressure. You know, you're not you're not getting passed by a million boats coming by you at 100 miles an hour. Absolutely. Final question: fastest boat production recreational boat ever made? 
Over 200 or not? Fastest recreational boat, production recreational boat right now would, I'm guessing, there's probably some boats that are approaching the 200 mile mark. Mm -hmm. And that none of that's ever been determined on any of my events. But there's an event called, there's, there's events called shootouts. Yeah. Which are essentially created for recreational boats and race boats. But there's a lot of recreational boats with factory stock engines, factory stock builds or hulls that go out and they have the opportunity to go fast in a, in a controlled environment, uh, in a calm water with spectator fleets. And it's basically a standing quarter mile yeah. or a kilo, they call it, standing kilo. And they're allowed to go as fast as they can for that one kilo and top out with a radar gun to what their speed is. So there are factory production boats that are approaching the 200 mile mark with obviously maxed out production race motors yeah, yeah. like Mercury Racing 1650s. You know, th th that's, that's a motor that races on racing fuel, but it's a production motor. So like anybody that can write the check can buy that motor. How fast have you been in a boat? Top speed and were you scared? My top speed in a boat uh, would have been about 160. And I can tell you which boat it was in too, this, this boat right here. MTI? This is a, uh, an MTI, a 48 foot MTI. It's got Mercury Racing 1350s. I think I went about 158 in this boat. And once. what was that like? Just hold on time and brown trousers? Su surprisingly, surprisingly not so bad because you're sitting down in a protected cockpit. The windshield is uh, you know, deflecting most of the air away from the boat. It's a little bit windy in the back seat. Uh, it's much better in the front seat. Yeah. But these, these are the boats that are, that are, the catamarans are the boats that are running 150, 160, no problem. Uh, and I, you're not gonna get me to go much faster than that, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, final question, Stu, if people wanna get involved with the club, how do they get involved, get in contact? We, uh, the easiest way is go on our website. Um, you can get a lot of information on the website, which is flpowerboat.com. Mm -hmm. And on that website are information about membership programs as well as events, all of our event platforms, where you can go, what events we have going on on a year-round basis. We operate year-round. Yep. Uh, the other thing you're gonna see is a lot of content. So the opportunity to see more boats by taking, uh, looking at our photo galleries from events and see videos. We have a lot of YouTube videos that you, you can you link to. You still do Power Boating in Paradise TV, right? We do, but it airs on YouTube now. Okay. Therefore, it's a great, uh, it's a great place for people to find us. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the YouTube channel is called Florida Powerboat Club. Okay. Uh, Stu Jones, my name is also in the title, so um, not that there's another Florida Powerboat Club, but that's where you're gonna find a lot of our content. We have a lot of fun little short sizzle reels that are about four minutes in length, and we have a lot of full length uh, shows that are half hour, which are what we call souvenir video series. Yep. Those are fully narrated, where we explain what's going on. They're narrated by me, we do the production in our own studio. Uh, we talk about the sponsors, we talk about the boats, so it really is a good way to become educated about the sport. Mm. Whether you want to join the sport or not, it's a good way to learn more about power boating. And you'll soon find out that these are just normal people that want to go and have a good time. And it just so happens that they enjoy that part of the sector, that sector within the marine side, recreational side. A lot of them might have a speedboat and they might have a yacht also. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of people that just love boating and they're going to get, get it whatever way they can. Perfect. Stu, thank you very much. All right, Zach, good Enjoy to be with show. you. Thank and, you very uh, much. We'll see you next time. You got it.